was the anointing. Uh, doesn't always make a noise, but you know. Thank you for that, uh, Carol Ann. Thank you. I, I've been thrilled that Carol could uh, come to uh, accompany me. Some of you will know it seemed very unlikely um, after her uh, surgery just uh, two weeks ago, less than two weeks ago. But it's been great, and for your uh, reception and kindness, uh, we are very grateful. I don't know if you saw the... Um, I've got a bit of... Uh, anyway, we'll all sort out, I'm sure, the sound. Uh, I don't know if you saw in the press nationally on Thursday about the couple in Statesboro, Georgia, called Sean Davidson and Melissa husband and wife of 10 years, 33 and 34 years old respectively, who were arrested for fighting after seeing the Passion of the Christ. When police arrived at their home, the wife had ripped her husband's shirt and he'd punched a hole in the sheetrock near the stairs. It was the dumbest thing we've ever done, said Melissa Davidson. We had been fighting over whether God the Father in the Holy Trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit was in human form or spiritual. Said Jean McDaniel, the Bullock County Chief Deputy, really it was kind of pitiful to go to a movie like that and fight about it. I think they missed the point. That's generally not been the response to the movie. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping as I come to the third a lecture for a kind of positive response. Uh, and it's always a, a difficult matter, weighing and pacing, when you have sessions moving through, and there's so much more you could say, and obviously you can't because of time. But what I want to do is to recapture something of the urgency with which we, I began. Uh, we do live in tumultuous times. Somebody has uh, recognized, I think it's David Bartlett in his work, uh, that we are probably statistically encountering a, a Pentecost every hour in terms of 3,000 Christians being one to Christ in terms of the world church. 3,000 Christian, Christians are born anew uh, every hour. And yet, most of that's occurring in the southern church. And in Latin America and Africa and Asia, there are extraordinary things happening which seems so in touch with, uh, with Jesus as Lord, in whom there's this immediacy of trust and in the power of the Spirit. As with um, Louise Bush of the Lausanne Covenant, I had lunch with him last month. And I asked him what was the most vital experience he'd been in recently. Uh, and he commented how he'd been with a million believers in Indonesia for prayer. Just all day praying. He said it was so vital, so I have to say, I, I'd never experienced anything like it. Over a million people just joined together for prayer. Could it be that some of us have allowed customs and traditions and local culture and past experience to come between us and this Jesus who can be so real? Is it possible that Jesus, the world's only saviour, the world's greatest leader, who's done other thing once and for all for us, uh, has been less directly connected because we've been looking elsewhere for programs and solutions when all the time he's there calling us in his power to belong and grow. He's given us all that we need. He spent 30 years preparing. His mission is the most focused there has ever been. And calling him Lord means putting him in control taking his leadership, his preaching leadership, on his own terms. And so for this lecture, I want to be as close as I can and to feel the pulse of Jesus. And I want to go to one of those passages which for me has been a very significant a reality check. It, it says much, and I think integrates much, of the concerns that I've been raising. And it's found in Luke chapter 4 reading from verse 42 through into chapter 5. It's uh, the story of Luke's uh, call of the first disciples. But beginning a little earlier, you sent something of the pacing 
And I want you to listen, and as we enter this, to let this set something of the grid for this, uh, this last um, lecture, thinking through some of the issues of the process of preaching leadership and of the skills in that skill circle that uh, God calls us to. At daybreak, daybreak, Jesus went to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to him where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because that's why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding round him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats, left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down, and he taught the people from the boat. And when he'd finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they'd taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything. And they followed him. If we enter something of the pulse of being close to Jesus, we are always aware that things began with prayer. And that's the first element, always, prayer. Uh, and I've emphasized that enough, and especially yesterday, talking about the ethos, the character of a preacher, that prayerfulness should be at the heart, that we practice prayerfulness and we, we preach it. It's not incidental that we call devotions quiet time. Because that, in a time of ordered peace and reflection, is when we engage and we connect. As I say in, in my book, in terms of my own spiritual journey, it was allowed to realize that when I went into the room, I didn't have to connect as though it was my energy. I just had to be open to a relationship where Jesus was already interceding for me. And that's how it always begins and always continues. And this passage reminds us of the essentials for our master and for ourselves. My father died this last uh, summer, 88 years old. He refused to have a television or have any distraction because of his desire to pray. He was an unusual man who divided his days into watches of prayer. And one of the most moving things was to take the old battered folio, uh, a leather, a case, in which were all his prayer documents, and to see how on the very day he was taken into hospital, he'd been early in the morning, four or five, at prayer, working through his commitments. No one can tell what in that little room was achieved eternally. And no one can tell when we pray, and our people pray, what the Lord will do next. Notice, though, that prayer leads on into preaching. Uh, this has been an emphasis that I've made, and I don't think you could have missed it. But here it's emphasized. Jesus, they want to stay with them and to keep on doing other things. 
for there are other things in his ministry, but he concentrates on the one thing. I must, he says, day, I am constrained to preach to others. That's why I was sent, verse 43. And he kept on preaching, verse 44. Preaching is central to the leadership of our Lord Jesus. He has a world to save, a world to love, and he does it by preaching, leading, which goes to the cross and beyond. Preaching is his preferred method. And though others may dramatize and systematize what's going on, it is by preaching that he calls and teaches, he disciples, he sends disciples out, Luke 9 and 10. It is by teaching that he finds his mission moving, the one mode but central, preaching preaching, preaching. It's fascinating to look at his preaching through the eyes of leadership literature. And I've been using uh, Harrington, Bonham and Fur, which speaks about the three kinds of leadership uh, the styles that we need, that need to complement and, and come together. In their book on Christian leadership, they say there is the core task which is strengthening spiritual and relational vitality. That's the core task, leadership. And nothing resonates more with preaching than this. And it cannot be contested that Jesus shares gospel life and creates relationships through preaching. And ever since, God informs and transforms people by his preachers. There's also a set of what they call task-oriented skills, which are required to develop and reach goals with the congregation. In their own book, they work on a, on a process with many stages which involve discerning vision and determining its vision path, communicating it widely, empowering teams, and ensuring its implementation. We find our Lord similarly moving through, and in the different stages of his mission, and as the disciples are led on through, so by preaching, Jesus moves on towards Jerusalem. He believes in finishing towers of building roofs on structures. Remember the parable in Luke 14, 28 to 30. And he will see the job done and he will keep on preaching. But third and very interesting are the skills to initiate and sustain transformation. And the latter part of their book, those of you who know it will be well aware, is about the disciplines you need to sustain and generate, initiate and sustain this transformation. Four disciplines. The first, the skill to generate and sustain creative tension. I spoke earlier about healthy conflict and it's much to do with that. The second, the ability to use mental models. The third discipline, the skills to collaborate with others. And fourthly, the ability to use systems thinking. And I want just to thread those disciplines into this passage for a moment. Because there's no doubt about it that Jesus is the master of generating and sustaining creative tension. You won't see that in a more disciplined way than the way in which Jesus does it. And it's explicit, for in verse 43, we hear the message of his preaching. It's summed up, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God. As soon as you mention kingdom, you are thrown into tension of the future present, the now yet not fully vindicated. But something happening in our midst which is complex and mysterious and draws us on, looking beyond and seeing new possibilities. From the beginning, Jesus stretches into the deeper purposes and the greater ways of living called kingdom ways. And ever since we carry two passports, to use something that Barbara Brown Taylor says in one of her sermons, we carry two passports. One, which is the country of our citizenship, we open up with an awful photograph in it, and the color of our eyes and our height and the expiry date. The other we carry locked into our persons. As children, 
of the kingdom. Sons and daughters of the Most High, royal priests, to all who received him, who believed in his name. He gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor human decision, children born of God. John 1, 12, 13. And there is no expiry date. I am the way, says Jesus, the truth and the life. I'm the journey. I'm actually the journey. Commit to me and you're on the way. And I'm the truth, the content. And I'm the saviour. And everything about your future is caught up now in belonging to me. Because I preach kingdom. And you belong to kingdom. And can you find any example of his preaching where there is not tension? He called people to kingdom to cross the gap between how things are now and how they might become by the grace of God. Always creating sustaining tension. Keeping people in kingdom talk. Never T-O-R-Q-U-E. Never arriving always pressing on, never having loved enough, never having forgiven enough, never having lived enough. As Oswald Chambers put it, he puts crowns just above our heads and expects us to grow into them. Never complacent, never bland, never predictable. The Christian story is living out in tension between the now and the not yet. And only by a gross act of myopic self-indulgence can preachers ever be self-congratulatory. It's a travesty that much church culture has forsaken kingdom tension for instant market gratification. There's been a massive sellout on the tension of the Christian life, of sanctification, radical love, and mission. And preachers just don't preach kingdom enough. We are called by our Lord to live out, live within the tension between the present reality and God's future promise. It begins with my personal vision, with how I woke up this morning and spent some moments communing with the Lord who longs for me today to grow. And it flows from that into every aspect as we worship together at the core of our life and into the business life and the mission life of the church. Jesus' way does not work like anything else for he calls us preacher leaders to preach and live out kingdom possibilities continuously stretched in faith. There is here prayer and there's preaching. And there is, of course, this change of direction. That's the kind of third dynamic. He's standing by the lake of Gennesaret, we're told, on this day. He sees two boats not being used by fishermen who are washing their nets. And that's not incidental, because we're told the previous night had been rough, and they'd fished all night, and they're not caught anything. And that all jobs have their downside, several downsides sometimes but washing stretching out, repairing nets when you haven't caught anything must be a big downside and Jesus chooses one boat, belongs to Simon, the Galilee registration is on the side of it he gets into it and there is some more preaching and then in verse 3 and we've preached this, we know it we've seen it When he'd finished, he says to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. This is going to be an active parable. Uh, The time for hearing words is over. And the weariness in Simon's voice, you you can hear it. Master, he says, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. But this is on Jesus' terms. And it does seem rather trivial, having preached about kingdom, the biggest realities there are, then to say they must go fishing and to push out in a boat there and then. But you see, the last time they tried, it didn't work. 
and he wants to show them in deep water what happens when they trust and obey him. They've only just washed and repaired nets, but by command, Jesus insists. And Simon says, but because you say so. This is one of the great, great comments to be made by preachers day by day. I'm weary and tired, but because you say so. I'm feeling really down, and to be honest, I've done this so many times before, it's routine. But because you say so. I've always given hope in this place. I've been here and it seems so dispiriting and you've no idea what I have to face. But because you say so. It takes us to the heart of the Lord who wants to do new things and to this uh, contrast of dynamic which lies underneath much leadership literature which uh, in Luke 5 terms is between the two dynamics facing, I believe, all Christian communities of the pull-in or the push-out dynamic. The pull-in dynamic is to stay where I am on the beach, safe in my comfort zone. And it's a speciality of transactional leaders, seeking what's mutually comfortable, avoiding what is uncomfortable and whenever there's cost or sacrifice or something new, avoiding it at all costs with the slogan because we say so. And many of us practice it skillfully in church life. In contrast is the dynamic which pushes out. Trusting Jesus in new places. Out of my comfort zone. Because he says so. Go to what's uncomfortable, risky, daring, possibly dangerous. But only those who push out and take risks with Jesus discover who Jesus really is. Only when you push out and let down the nets can Jesus make it happen. He's not going to make the fish jump into the boat. You have to put the nets down to discover what it means with Jesus in this place you've been before. New things can happen in his dynamic. Fishing is the paradigm for mission. Of course it is. And Jesus wants to show how it works. To use contemporary jargon, he's being missional. It's no good staying on the beach and expecting the fish to surrender themselves to flop with happy smiles on their faces. There is the need, because of faith and action, to push out. And this leads to one of those skills for transformational leadership, which uh, Harrington calls the ability to use mental models. I've already used one. Uh, A mental model is a picture, an assumption, speaking of complex things, but in a way you can just grasp. Uh, Stay, pull in, move, push out. Here you've got two models. And there's much work being done on the current mental models of a church. Uh, Aubrey Malfour's charts six different church models in American evangelical churches. Some of you will have seen those charts and charts like it. The first of the six is called the classroom church. Its unifying value is information. The pastor's role is teacher and the people's role student. The key emphasis is to know and the source of legitimacy is expository preaching. The sixth model and his preferred model is life development church, he calls it. The unifying value is character. The role of pastor is coach, people, ministry. Its key emphasis to be and its source of legitimacy is changed lives. There is in Luke 5 this profound dynamic which characterizes the contrast between the church which is stuck 
which Harrington describes as the older model, marked by things like slow, predictable change, shared values between church and community, pastor as manager, stable strategies from denomination. And in contrast, the new mental model, which has rapid, discontinuous change. It has divergent values from the community. It's in a missionary context. It has pastor as leader. It has continuous adjustments to be made in strategy. This second model resonates with the push out, with the risk, with the unknown, and with the dependency on the Christ of new ways. Its characteristics are risk and change. And the gospel and cultural network flowing out of the important work of Leslie Newbegin, who lived just down the road from the Spurgeons and would come in and take chapel for us. The idea of a missional church being a transforming presence in the world. The church and some of the characteristics you will know, I, I'm sure you've read the literature, that Christians behave Christianly towards one another. I mean, there's a thought. Christians behaving Christianly towards one another, practicing reconciliation, accountable in love, practicing hospitality. And in this desire for a missional vocation for the entire uh, community, the missional church is characterized as one with a worship which is filled with joy and thanksgiving for God's presence and God's promised future. Always the creative tension. And Eddie Gibbs says, there's a recognition in such a church that the church itself is an incomplete expression of the reign of God. I love that. A recognition that we're an incomplete expression of the reign of God. What more is there we could see? We're on the move, behaving Christianly towards one another. I believe that preacher leaders have strategic responsibility to assess the mental models that we hold and others hold about their churches in the light of the current reality. To help us see the implications of pushing out for the mission of Jesus Christ. And no one should underestimate the need for courage within this process. Because change threatens, and it threatens me more than most when I'm preacher, leader. And that's why the qualities of self-disclosure, empathic listening, critical thinking... All these are so vital in this question of the, the mental model that we actually live in and the one our Lord calls us to. I have to say also that I, I see here the third discipline, which is that of collaborating with others. It's interesting that Jesus identifies in one of the boats. He doesn't send them off to fish out there. He goes with Simon. Uh, and then... As this huge response overwhelms, they signal to their partners in the other boat, verse 7, and they come alongside and help them. And you have this extraordinary picture of being overwhelmed as the teams work together and haul the nets. Teams are universally endorsed by leadership studies. In my reading on leadership, I've not found anybody who does not endorse team. It's become a truism that for any organization to be effective, there must be teams and intentional team learning. A process of enabling a team to produce results far beyond its combined capabilities as individuals. We noticed how in the survey, 2003 survey by Christianity Today, 71% uh, of pastors thought they were team players and 48% of their congregants agreed. The truth is that we all preach body and unity and diversity and how much we need each other, but when it comes down to it, we're not always fully convinced. 
the truth is that to work with others and to take seriously this overworked expression of mentoring teams, to be in relationship with people where you're vulnerable and they truly learn from you, is demanding and exhausting. And many of us have never been trained to do it. We were trained as solo people who find our security in being affirmed as solo people and frankly feel affirmed, uh, feel uh, insecure when other people are affirmed instead of us. And so many preachers are reluctant team players, never fully understood the role, think accountability is rather overdone and have not mastered the skills which enable other people to grow alongside us. Too many of us shadow box with team. And I believe the rich literature on team building must be taken extremely seriously. Two aspects are often elevated as the most important about team. First, that leaders need to commit personally to team in spite of its consumption of time and energy because they genuinely recognize its value. That commitment to team is, is so important. And I know in my own experience, when I began to develop team and realized its value, I did so with a covenant, which made sure that I, with those joined with me in team, would have the bonds of openness and trust, so that when on a Monday we met to evaluate the Sunday, there could be complete honesty about what had happened and what we'd done. But when someone spoke ill or disloyally, about another member of a team. We had a covenant never to countenance that, but always stand together rather than give in to the weaknesses of insecure people. We need to commit personally to team. And the second thing is leaders must resolve to develop necessary t skills of team learning. This requires expertise. It isn't something that comes naturally to most of us. Building teams, establishing performance challenges, which is a, a key issue, the ability to engage in dialogue, the vulnerability, these are all vital. And however small, however small the fellowship we serve as preacher leaders, team is vital. I mentioned in my first lecture John McClure's book about roundtable preaching and about how in the act of preaching itself others can be involved in us. And from personal experience, I have to say there's nothing like knowing as you anticipate the next four Sundays of preaching to draw people alongside you who wrestle with the text alongside you and then open yourselves up to them. They become partners not just in helping you to understand how this text is resonating, but how that word needs to be declared, how the worship needs to be shaped, how, how the whole thing might fit together. And I was <clears throat> never, I think, more effective than when my team worked with me so it became our response to the Lord whose words to be declared. And yes, I did it in terms of one person in the end articulating, but it was, it was team. It was directed and nurtured, prayed for, and evaluated by team. All my students do all their work in their sermon preparation in teams. They're each given their own text, but they prepare, they do their exegesis, they do their interpretation in teams. Only once in my years of training have I come across one person who refused to share with the team. Uh, nearly always the, the, the barriers have been broken down and there's enough trust to realize that there are benefits here, but this particular character refused. He was fairly subtle about it. He pretended he hadn't done very much and uh, he, he let other people talk, but actually he shared not a thing because he wanted to impress us with the finished article, you see. And he didn't want to spoil it. So when the finished article came, he began with the lamest joke I've ever heard. Well, actually, I'd heard it many, many times before. 
just to have opened up to other people, somebody would have said to him, is that the best way to begin? As the story moves on, we see following this pushing out, this working in teams in faith, that there is, fourthly, in terms of the acts of this drama, a God happening in the midst. It could have only occurred once they'd moved and in deep water lowered nets. And in spite of weariness, and in spite of bad past experience, and in spite of exhaustion, mentally and physically and emotionally, they find God does something new so the fish fill first the one boat and then the other comes alongside and then the other and the previous night when they couldn't even find a single one they are now with fish everywhere fish, fish flying everywhere I mean there's so many fish they suddenly realise that the water level is the same as the level of the boat and they just can't cope with any more fishing is the paradigm for mission for God happenings that always surprise. They're never predictable and they overwhelm the mediocre expectations of weary people. And this is a sign of the kingdom. It's going to be like the transfiguration which lights them up and for a season they see who Jesus is and then it closes again and they go through the agony and the misunderstanding of passion and then it blazes open again in resurrection. This is a sign we are given signs and we must always live because we know God happenings are possible when we push out in the dynamic of move for him God is in this story and we need to remember as we go to our places of work and perhaps weariness God is in our story and he's writing the script and he's directing the movie Within this, the fifth act is encounter his holiness. As Simon witnesses all this, he realizes he cannot cope with this person, Jesus. In the words of Eugene Peterson in the message, he says, Master, leave me. I'm a sinner and I can't handle this holiness. Leave me to myself. And until we've encountered the real God in action, we shall never understand how holy he is and how utterly unholy we are. And that ongoing experience of inadequacy and depth is the ground rock for Christian leadership, Christian preaching, and the eventfulness that God makes possible. We should never become too familiar, too casual, too arrogant. Who God is whose ways are not our ways, holds us dependent upon him. The fourth discipline of generating transformation is something they call systems thinking. And those of you, and I know many of you, have been involved in leadership studies and, and, and teach it. Systems thinking clearly is about the way in which we see the whole together. And older leadership studies tended to be analytical and to take apart elements and then uh, looking at them in turn to see whether health or disease was and then put them back together. Alistair Mant, in his book Intelligent Leadership, calls this the bicycle approach. And it's okay to take a bicycle apart and repair it and put it back together again. However, he contrasts that with the frog approach, where to dissemble, disassemble becomes slightly fatal. And churches are frogs, not bicycles. And we're drawn into what increasingly leadership studies speak of in terms of holistic systems, recognizing that the health of one area actually is, is related to so much else that we might not quite see, as is disease. And even in the small church, there's a complex system full of spiritual and human dynamics, connected parts of layers, the impact of events 
and trends and structures and personalities. And we're called out to recognize that our Lord God calls us to be part of a complex system. Whereas we preach and we lead little by little, basin full by basin full, complex interact reactions occur because the whole belongs together. It seems a little thing to get into a boat and to go out to be given a, a paradigm for mission, but they will never have forgotten this. It seems a little thing, some of those things you go back to do, yet the Lord will take and will multiply. And you will, find, you will have found that at the end of a ministry as you leave, Sometimes people thank you for things that you, you cannot remember taking place. But for them were signals of transcendence. For they say, saw God break through. It all belongs together. And it calls for you and me a very careful openness that we might truly live and act as the body of Christ. And then they're given the commission. And in Luke's gospel, this is where it happens. Don't be afraid. How interesting that courage here is so vital because, because Simon has perceived his inadequacy. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch people. One of you said to me after one of the sessions we've had, you know, it so much depends upon the call uh, and how, as the Lord calls us, he continually encourages and affirms us, and we mustn't lose sight of a call. Oh, we must never. Uh, and whenever we're together, we need to be re reminded of that call, which perhaps for some of us was a long time ago, but which is the essential relationship, where in spite of our unholiness, Jesus says, don't be afraid. I call you to catch people to push out in mission for me. The reason why I'm so committed to this is that for my ministry, and I so miss local church, I wonder sometimes, I think my wife does, whether we go back to that. She certainly was, she was effectively used in local church. And I just wonder, because that's where it happens. I've given hints in different places about how going to the downtown church in Cambridge, founded in 1721, holding a thousand people, just 70 there. I was dri driven to a place of desperation, wondering what was the Lord going to do, and wondering whether I should bury this church uh, with uh, a, a genuine sense of thanks for what God had done there, but because he was moving on. And sometimes that happens. One day I was called in the beginning of the year. One day in spring, somebody asked me to go down to the church to meet them there. And I cycled, everybody cycles in Cambridge, and I cycled down to the church. And I recall now putting my bicycle by the side, and I said I'd meet them on the front steps. The church is a, an impressive looking building, a big oak doors. Which, I stand, stood by one of these oak doors, closed, of course, because of vandalism and problems. And, and the person didn't show. I've forgotten who they were now. But in the, in the, the period of something like a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes of waiting, I saw a vision. It didn't need much insight. I had never been down to that church on a busy weekday and recognized the hundreds of people walking our, past our front doors. Uh, shoppers, big shops nearby, laden with shopping bags. Tourists with their cameras chattering excitedly. Uh, students uh, racing past. Uh, foreign students wobbling dangerously on bicycles they shouldn't have been riding. Uh, a, a, a whole gathering of business people, the down and outs, the, 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 the people who are desperately begging on the sidewalk. Five deep, continuously, without a break, P 
people streamed past. And I felt the challenge and the irony that the only time we were open and the only time I'd ever been down there was when this city of 110,000 people and many more visiting, the only time we were ever open was when the city was quiet and closed. We specialized on Sundays, which in days before Sunday trading meant that we could park without any problem because nobody else was there. We closed our church entirely, apart from the occasional uh, evening meeting and uh, round the corner, uh, a ladies' sewing circle. And I felt the Lord speaking to me about being his people on that patch. And when it came to this prayer that I've spoken about, one of the very first prayer agendas, and we used to set five or six issues, we prayed about what we pray about in June 1980. And I'd only begun in, 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 in January. Uh, we had on the prayer agenda, which was printed and everybody had it and prayed every, every day and every week we, we monitored what was happening. Item number four was, let's pray for a clear vision of God's will for our city centre strategy, particularly the use of our premises. And that came out of a vision that I discovered so many other people prayed about. Why were we on one of the busiest streets in one of the cities of Europe. What was it all about? And everything about our life as a fellowship was immersed in this prayer without a clue about what it meant. And on the New Year's Eve of 1981, on the eve of 1982, I remember vividly using the overhead projector that I always did. What are the things we should be praying for? Where's the focus going to be? What have we learned so far? Somebody said, why don't we pray specifically for people to come to Christ? Why, why can't we really go flat out for it? And it seemed good to do that. But it also seemed unnerving when somebody else said, why can't we be specific and pray for a certain number to come to Christ in 1982? And I remember thinking, this is, uh, this is a little bit dangerous because if we put it, I mean, putting a number... And I remember thinking I never had anything about this in my training to be a minister. And uh, I don't think I've read anything about it. It seems a bit immature. But it also seems to lack in faith. And we prayed about it. And I can't remember exactly how it happened. But in the end, the number 50 went down. Which I think probably was one new Christian every week with two weeks vacation. This church had only had a very few people come to faith there. Uh, very few in the previous decades. It wasn't that kind of church, as people said to me. Uh, and it took 14 months. It took 14 months for 50 new Christians. Extraordinary stories. People off the street who saw the posters that Carol used to do. That was part of her ministry. I can't tell you. I had one man who came who'd not been near a church, saw the poster, came in absolutely broken. All his life, he said, was spent working in order to go out a single man to throw darts in the local public house. And he said, my life is working, drinking and darting. And he said, I, I know there's more. And he came in. And I remember him being baptized on his own. A big man. A hesitant man. But a man now full of new life. And he was baptized and, and I asked in the power of the Lord. But as he'd made his witness, if the Lord was calling you, would you right now come here and stand in order to be willing to take this step in the baptismal pool? to show that Jesus is Lord in this city. And as the church, most heads down, uh, a great deal of nervousness, uh, some distaste, some people objected that kind of appeal, we began to see people come forward. A seven people came forward. The church had never seen that. When they were baptized, more came forward. We never had a service where there weren't people who responded. And it was all because in prayer, 
we were concerned about who we were and what vision the Lord was going to give us. And so it goes on. And I parallel the Luke 4, Luke 5 with the kind of experiences over 14 years. And by the way, I think it does take a number of years. The way in which the telling out and living out became close to Jesus. The pushing out in our mission, vision, that we would be open seven days a week. And we would be there for whoever came through our doors. We would be for the seriously psychiatrically disturbed. We would be there for the homeless. We would be there for the foreign student, completely at loss. We would be there for the people who worked and who just passed by the church and needed to know that this was a living people using premises to express the best news in the world. There were God happenings and it's because of that and my experience of that my ministry was forever changed and I talk about preacher leaders. I also know that within that there was much pain. There was a great need for courage. I have my own serious illness that I refer to in my book which at one point really led me to a place of this kind of encounter with God again and a sense of my own deep inadequacy. But I stand before you as somebody who believes with all my heart uh, that our Lord God calls us to be preacher leaders. And in who we are to manifest those ethos characters because it's in flesh, our flesh, that the Lord wants to do something. And through our skills, preaching and leading, to find that we as a whole people are moving out missionally for his glory. Thank you. That ringing uh, challenge to us, I wonder if some of you would like to ask a few questions to engage Dr. Quick. Yes, Neville? Is there a particular style of preaching, inductive, deductive, that lends itself more readily to leading through the pulpit? I was asked a question a little like this uh, yesterday, and I think the answer I gave there, then, um, oversimplified it. What I said yesterday was that, you know, there are in my book I say there are four kinds of preacher, and they're all biblical. There's a teacher preacher, there's a herald preacher, there's the pastor, the inductive preacher, and there's the storyteller, the, the narrative, rather the narrative preacher, the plotted form preacher, who wants to uh, take people on a journey, rather like Craddock and some of the new homiletic. And I said that we actually begin as individuals often with strengths towards one of those rather than another. And I try and encourage people to be stretched so that they're not just a teacher preacher, but they recognize that there is a power in other ways. So I think beginning with who we are as individuals, some of us are very much more, for example, some people are wonderful narrative preachers. Uh, dwelling in scripture and taking us to places which are, are really authentic. Sometimes for others it sounds artificial and it doesn't resonate. And so we've got to be, we begin with being who we are and recognizing there are different ways of preaching the word, just as there are different genres of scripture. However, I do believe, and this is where I've reflected a little more on it, uh, that when you look at this in practice, because we are a prayer and working with our leaders. For example, I remember in the church in Cambridge, uh, we recognized as the church had grown, it was vital to encourage small groups uh, as the place to grow. Now this is, again, one of the common, it's a truism, but if you meet, there are 500 of you meeting for celebration, you need to have cells where people can really belong and grow. Otherwise, it can become an escape. 
But in order to move towards a place where small groups were, were totally understood as part of being church, I remember being challenged in leadership about needing to preach on that and to take those parts of scripture uh, which particularly speak about relationships in groups, and small groups, and mentoring in groups, and there's a lot there, in order to construct a series which had a very practical purpose of it nudging people all the time to join the structures that we were offering, which we believed that were really God's way to help us grow. And it had to be a fairly purposeful preaching. It could, you could argue, be in danger of manipulation, and I'm sure such preaching, or motivational preaching, runs that risk. And that's one of the dangers, which I haven't talked to about much, but it's there. But I think when you come to issues like that, there needs to be an intentionality so that people hear something that you tell out that mustn't be left too inductive, though you can certainly make links to help people and to make stories ring true. But to make sure that the point is clear, the teaching is outlined, and there's an urgency. And many leader preachers tend towards more of a herald style. The declaring of the, the bold idea uh, so that you get it in the grace by the grace of God. You get it. Uh, rather than what some specialize in, which is a more layered, multifaceted, where you get a tremendous number of things going on because essentially every verse has been touched upon. Uh, or, of course, the more experiential journey sermon of the narrator. So I do believe that we can lead uh, when God calls us as preachers in different ways but I do sense that there needs at times to be a boldness. And uh, we wanted everybody to belong to a group, and you will know how difficult that is. Uh, but alongside the preaching, there was a, an intentional structure for everyone to be visited. Everybody was allocated. And we made them pastoral groups in order that people understood that first and foremost, it was our mutual care and love that bound us together. But all of that did require a very specific kind of preaching. And I think if I go on thinking through this, there need to be good examples like that so that people could see, yeah, I could see how that might work in terms of God's word working through. Does that, does that help at all? Yes. Dr. Clayton? Sorry, with the emergence of so many new communication technologies, this kind of thing, as pastors were communicators, uh, especially from the pulpit, I'm wondering, is there any new technologies that are really you're really excited about, or any that you're leery about, or do you believe we should all be Luddites and let God work the way he always has? I just want to wonder, what's exciting for you, and what sort of, what are you missing around it, in, in this emerging world that offers so much more to us uh, as communicators? That's a, that's a great question, taking us just on to something which is obviously I mentioned in, in the book. Uh, I, I actually, when I think back to the sermons I can recall vividly, I'm one of those people who can tell you the two or three sermons which worked so well because there was image and sound. Using a screen, using PowerPoint, using video, so well. I'm not exaggerating, I can tell you how it threaded through. It made an impact. So I'm somebody who actually believes that image and sound stereo, as I call it, when people are involved, and one of the things I say in the book is our young people are often an untapped resource here. You've got 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds who are just brilliant, and they're creating their films online. <laughs> and here, some of them love Jesus and would love to help us when it comes to communion to have something on the screen which enables people just to reflect. Or when it comes to prayers of intercession, just to show and to screen so that we can actually focus on areas of need in ways that actually, for many of us, open us up. Even if we're not that visual, suddenly bring us into a different way of experiencing reality. So I can honestly say, I think if I was a local pastor now, I'd be building, as I was when I was in the church, I had worship teams who took responsibility 
as the church grew for different parts of it, I know I'd be working to use, use uh, image and sound and make sure that not all the good stuff happens with the music, where everybody's worked very hard, sometimes hours into that, and then you come to the preacher, and there they are, back Luddite, like, like uh, as though, oh, well, now it, you know, it doesn't matter. It's not really that important. This is just the preaching bit. Uh, and uh, sadly, that often appears to be the case. Uh, the other thing is, I've been to churches where the use of PowerPoint has been the most execrable, uh, the most appalling thing ever. And I yearn for the person to switch it off and just speak to us. Because all they were doing were putting up words and words, and the thing was overwhelmingly tedious. And I remember a man saying to me, who was a, he's a, an accountant, he said, you know, we're sent on courses to use uh, PowerPoint. And, you know, there's only a ratio. I think it's ten screens for half an hour or something. He said, I just wish our pastor had been on one of those courses. So we've got to be very careful because I think some of what we see today is appalling and it's gimmicky and it adds nothing. But when we understand that image and word means that words need to create image and also image can reinforce and complement word and how worship as a whole can resonate, especially for our young people. It's, we need to be listening out to our young people who do their work assignments on a screen which is split. This is how I think I've gone off. Anyway. my voice. This is how I believe we are being challenged for the under 35s today. Have I run out of power? Sounds better off. Sounds better off. <laughs> Dr. Quick, you, you mentioned that you thought that one time um, or the most effective time of preaching for you was when you had this team concept going. And uh, I think it's kind of untraditional for us in the way that we typically think about teams uh, in ministry. People are responsible for different areas and maybe you powwow together to, to come up with strategies for those areas. But not actually having a pastor, preacher, leader who is asking someone else or a number of people to actually wrestle with the text uh, with them. And I'm wondering, who would compose uh, such a team? Well, uh, this is where, if you look at uh, David Schlafer and John McClure, uh, uh, I've mentioned uh, John McClure, uh, and in, in my book I mentioned two or three people who've written on this. They give very concrete ideas. Sometimes it begins by asking for volunteers, uh, and it, you've got to be careful about that. Uh, but often, for me, for example, the immediate members of my team were part of that. And there are people involved in worship who had a real heart for this. And they wanted to be involved because for them, Sunday, they were willing to invest a huge amount of effort. And uh, completely out of love. There was never anything, you know, I found in the church where I've been involved in Wheaton, that, you know, one almost, almost has to pay people to get them to do anything. There's a kind of expectation. Well, these were people who just out of love were involved. But if you can, to actually, John McClure suggests, invite people so that they structure the little. You do have a, a woman who's going to be uh, perceptive and, and, and um, able to speak about issues, recognizing that they represent the majority probably. And, and a young person. And you do intentionally represent something of a generation. If you can do that and say for six months, will you come and help and join me? Which is what John McClure says. But after six months, another group can join you. And he's been doing it for years. Many people have now done this. And they're part of something which they own. Which is why he says in his book, where leadership and preaching meet. Now, he wouldn't have the same theology, I think, about congregational transformation. Uh, and uh, probably wouldn't share some of the things I, I've been sharing. But I do think there's mileage in the kind of structure he suggests. But I began, essentially, with the people who were doing it with me. But opening up the preaching, and they were amazed. Because it does mean you, you could be told you've got it wrong. 
And it does mean when you're just, you're in danger of using a story you've used oh several times. You know when preachers say, you'll have heard me say this before. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, you know, we have actually. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's a real strength in working on this. But it does call forth from the preacher probably more energy and uh, vulnerability than, uh, than almost anything else we do. Because it's much easier to do it ourselves. And then to have the comments afterwards, great job. I, that's something which I've never heard till I came, great job. You know, I, you know uh, well, it is my job. But, uh, but I, I, that isn't actually the best, you know, what, what about, oh, I met God today. Sorry, yeah.